viewers welcome to this lecture series on elementary quantum mechanics i'm sure that you all know uh, that quantum mechanics deals with uh, study of microscopic uh, particles like atoms molecules and things like that it studies the nature and behavior of the, the such kind of particles and in this lecture series uh, to make a beginning what we will do try to do is that in the first two episodes i'll try to establish that why did we need something like quantum mechanics what was uh, the drawback with classical mechanics which was there prevalent at that point of time that is uh, i'm going to basically establish the inadequacy of classical mechanics that's a, i'm going to spend two episodes on that okay and uh, uh, the the lecture plan for today's session happens to be as follows that is we'll first look at what is the basic premise of classical mechanics that is what is classical mechanics what does it do and how does it serve our purpose thereafter we'll see that what kind of experiments are there which pose challenge to classical mechanics that is there are certain experiments which could not be answered or could not be explained on the basis of classical mechanics we'll try to have a look at them and in this process uh, i'll take up two such uh, important experiments uh, that happen to be black body radiation and photoelectric effect in today's episode i will try to see what were the experiments what kind of results were obtained and what were the classical predictions for those experiments and how the two were mismatching so in this process we'll try to see that uh, our classical mechanics is inadequate to explain these results and then to, uh, towards the end we'll try to sum up what we learned in today's session okay let's make a beginning let's make a beginning by looking at what is classical mechanics uh, actually if you really ask me classical mechanics is a, a set of laws that have been formulated on the basis of our observation of nature over a period of centuries altogether that means whatever we gathered in terms of uh, uh, looking at the motion of uh, 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 kind of astronomical bodies sun moon and things all around us so we see things in macroscopic world and all those observations have been documented or formulated in terms of certain laws and the three basic pillars of classical mechanics are the newton's laws of motion the gravitational law and maxwell equation these three put together uh, put a classical mechanics on a very strong foundation and on the basis of these practically most of the things we know of uh, in the macroscopic world could be explained now if that be so uh, let's take some examples now uh, let's see uh, how do we put classical mechanics into use i'm sure that uh, this pictures will be quite uh, illustrative to you uh, the first picture here uh, talks about uh, a baseball game the same thing happens in case of even cricket as well so what we see here is uh, the player has shot the ball and uh, uh, the fielder here is trying to assess a certain where the ball is going to fall so that he can uh, anticipate the catch and take it same thing happens in cricket as well now in this case we are not making any calculations per se but we are doing uh, some kind of a mental calculation we see okay where does where, how is it going how high is it going where is it going to fall so we anticipate and position ourselves to make the catch okay so that is a kind of mental calculation but all that uh, again are based on our understanding of classical mechanics okay this is one aspect of it now here what we see is this is a typical picture i'm sure that most of you would have come across this picture this is uh, uh, we're trying to uh, predict suppose the ball had hit with because now we know uh, in the uh, in the instrumentation is available now at the moment the ball leaves the baller uh, we can work out at what stage has it gone what is the uh, force on that where is it going to fall where is it going to land up eventually thereafter that is whether it's going to hit the stumps or not so that can be predicted fairly well and then we believe in the outcome of such kind of predictions and even same thing happens in case of tennis as well so there are three instances in from sports we know that we can put classical mechanics to use and then we have reasonably good faith on the outcome of such uh, predictions we can take certain more examples we know that in rocket science when we launch rockets or a satellite going up we know precisely when to plan all the events which are going to take place in the process of launch of satellite to its establishment in the orbit everything is well planned precisely in terms of time what is going to happen at what height at what time and so on and so forth okay so this all is possible because we know uh, our, our classical mechanics laws are perfectly uh, predictable perfectly useful similarly we can even predict the cosmic events like when are we going to have a meteor shower we can predict it and we actually see we can go uh, rooftop and then actually enjoy that thing because it happens the way it is predicted because we know how things are going to happen in time now that is as regards our 
the validity, so to say, of classical mechanics. Towards the end of 19th century, that is around 1890s and things like that, people thought, uh, uh, people in physics particularly thought, there's nothing left in physics because uh, they were so contented with uh, uh, the success of classical mechanics that practically anything which you come across, you can explain fairly well. The only thing probably physicists were doing at that point of time was uh, to see that if I can make measurements slightly more uh, accurate. For example, uh, if I have a table, if I measure its length, say it is about 1.7 meters, maybe I can use a different scale and make it ok. I can measure it to 1.73 meters or maybe 7.32 meters or maybe I can go even further down. That means, I am just looking forward to an extra decimal place. That means, there is nothing new to happen. Only thing is I am trying to get more and more uh, accurate measurement and that is not very, very significant. So, people thought that nothing is left in physics to the extent even that uh, a physicist by the name Philip von Jolly uh, actually advised Max Planck not to pursue physics because there is nothing what he could expect from physics to happen at that point of time. And fortunately for us that Max Planck did not listen to him because it is who uh, uh, it is Max Planck who actually gave us the quantization concept and the quantum mechanics as we know of today. Okay. Now, in the backdrop of such a scenario that everything is predictable, there were certain experiments. Uh, uh, the experimental found findings were such which posed challenge to this established uh, kind of a branch of science, domain of science that is classical mechanics. Uh, there are five significant challenges, uh, the black body radiation, photoelectric effect, anomalous heat capacity of solids, atomic line spectra and Compton scattering. Uh, in fact, uh, the last one, the fifth one actually is not a challenge per se, but uh, I am putting it, uh, clubbing it here because this also could not be explained on the basis of classical mechanics. In fact, Compton scattering was used to uh, kind of verify the, uh, the photon concept given by Einstein. We will come to that later on, maybe in the next episode we will talk about it. And out of these five experiments I am listing here, uh, in today's episode, I will try to discuss about two, the first two of them in little more details. We will see what are the experiment, what are these systems, what kind of results are obtained and then where does classical mechanics falter in explaining them. Okay, Let us make a beginning with the first experiment that is black body radiation. Uh, to come to black body radiation, let us understand that uh, we know that anything which is hot emits radiation. Uh, I am sure that you would have uh, experienced uh, while sitting close to a fireplace that heat comes to you in the form of a radiation. And also we would have seen if you visited a blacksmith you would have seen uh, as uh, the blacksmith goes on heating uh, the iron rod to higher and higher temperature the color of iron rod changes. It is a general phenomenon that anything which is hot is going to emit radiation and the nature of radiation which comes from hot object will depend on two things one the temperature and two the nature of the material being talked about. Now, uh, and this is just a small listing over here. What we see is that when the temperature is low, say around room temperature or so, or my body temperature for that matter, we admit what is called as IR radiation. And as the temperature goes up, we see that the color becomes cherry red. If it becomes about 1000 degrees centigrade, it becomes yellowish. At higher temperature, it becomes white. And even beyond 2000 degrees centigrade, maybe we can expect UV radiations coming from the hot object. So, what you see is that the output from a hot object depends on the temperature. And uh, I am sure that uh, you would have come across this ear thermometers nowadays being used, especially for children. Uh, the basic principle of this thermometer is that when you insert that probe into the ear of the child, because the body of the child is emitting, the child has fever, the temperature is more than the normal world, what is saying. So, the IR radiations which come, that will be sensed by the sensor of the thermometer and that will display it as a reading on the thermometer. That is, it is a purely a very, very convenient proposition and this device has been created by NASA uh, for different purposes there, but it is put to common use nowadays. Now, let us come to what is black body. Black body actually uh, is an ideal system and I am sure that we all know that nothing ideal exists per se. Ideal are systems which do not exist on their own, but uh, we can come to a close approximation to them. And a black body by definition is a body which uh, absorbs all radiations which fall on it and in turn when heated emit all radiations out of it. Let us take an approximation of that. Now, suppose I have a hollow sphere, say I have a sphere 
which is empty from inside, it's hollow. And I make a small pinhole in that. When I have that, then any radiation, so this is just a depiction of that. Suppose some radiation gets into this pinhole. So once this gets in, the radiation will go, strike the wall opposite to it and get reflected inside. And then this radiation which has gone into the sphere will get reflected repeatedly and eventually it will get absorbed there. No matter what is the kind of radiation I am throwing on that, that will get absorbed. So in principle, what we can say is such a body is a perfect absorber. It absorbs all radiation falling on that. And if I heat it in turn, when the radiations come out of the black body, uh, uh, come out of such a body, that will be uh, giving all possible radiations. So, such a body which is a perfect absorber as well as a perfect emitter is called as a black body. So, uh, the radiation which come from such a body is called as black body radiation. Let us try to see what are the results we obtain in case of black body radiation. The three very crucial results what you obtain. The first one is as the temperature of black body increases, what you find uh, the amount of radiation coming off increases. That is, this gives you some measure of the intensity or energy density because this axis is energy density. That means, amount of red energy coming out as a uh, per unit wavelength. So, on this axis we have got wavelength and this axis is energy emitted uh, or energy density, energy emitted per unit wavelength. Okay? So, what you find is that as the temperature increases, we find that say from 35 degree, 100 degree centigrade Kelvin to 4000 to 4500 and so on and so forth, as temperature is being increased, we find the energy output is more and more. That means, you can see it in terms of area under these curves. The area under these curves goes and increases, that is the first observation. The second observation here is, as the temperature increases, we find uh, say at a given temperature 3500 K, what you find is that this is the kind of distribution we have. At this particular wavelength, there is a maximum energy coming off. As we increase temperature, we find that this maxima shifts to these sides. What we see is a trend of this kind. That is, as temperature is increasing, our maxima shift to a lower wavelength. That is something what we observed in case of blacksmith's example. That means, when the iron rod was heated more and more, the color changes. That is, the outcome, that is the maximum wavelength which is coming out is different over there. And the third most crucial observation here is the spectrum depends on temperature and not on the nature of object. That means, what is the black body made up of does not matter. The only thing is the outcome will depend on the temperature of the black body. So, this is in contrast to what we had in case of a general observation. That is, the energy output will depend on the nature as well as the temperature of the body. So, th that is a basic difference over here. Now, Classically speaking, there are certain observations we have to see how do we reconcile with what we experimentally observe. Uh, there are three important uh, things here again. First is your Stephens law. Stephens law proposed initially by Stephens, later on modified by Boltzmann or also called as Boltzmann Stephens law. What it says is the rate of emission of radiation, uh, radiation energy from a surface of hot object is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature, that is absolute temperature. And uh, what happens is, we have the outcome output coming here is proportional to T4 and that actually explains our first observation in a way that, that, that accounts for the first observation that as temperature increases the energy output is increasing. Second important law is what is called as Wien's displacement law. What it says is the lambda max of the wavelength distribution shifts to lower wavelengths as temperature increases. What it means uh, what it says is the lambda max into T is a constant that means if T goes up, lambda max has to come down and that explains the shift in the wavelength maximum of the emission. So, the two observations are there broadly. That means, uh, qualitatively speaking, okay, there will be increase, we find an increase there. There will be a shift in lambda max that also we are explaining. When we try to uh, explain the energy distribution curve, the whole curve as such in terms of uh, using Stephen Boltzmann law and modifying that further. He gave an expression which shows that E lambda that is energy emitted at a given wavelength is proportional to lambda 5 and so on and so forth. This agreed to a good extent with the experimental observation. What you find is that these dots are our experimental points and this dotted line here gives you uh, the prediction from Wien's law. 
and we find that uh, for lower wavelength wins exp uh, explanation matches with the experiment whereas for high wavelengths there is a discrepancy over there next serious effort was made by lord rayleigh and later on modified slightly by jeans and what lord rayleigh said was the black body he assumed the black body to be a collection of oscillators that means the atoms and molecules constituting the uh, object or uh, the black body is, is visualized as an oscillator over there that can absorb em radiation of all possible frequencies that is you talk about classical mechanics energy is continuous and then second assumption was total energy which is available to a system that is distributed amongst all possible oscillators in the system so on the basis of these two assumptions uh, lord rayleigh proposed the following expression uh, formulated the following expression and this expression was in reasonable agreement with the the high wavelength region of the uh, the spectrum what we got in case of black body radiation we find that for the higher wavelength region here there is a agreement between experiment and theory this is your curve from lord rayleigh's prediction and these are your experimental curves but whereas for the lower wavelength region there is a mismatch over there so we find that wien's law explains the lower wavelength region lord rayleigh's proposition explains the high wavelength region but none of the two gives you the whole curve that means our classical attempts to explain black body radiation happen to be inadequate so we find that predictions of classical mechanics are not in agreement with experiment and we find that classical mechanics is inadequate to explain our black body radiation and we need something uh, different from this uh, mechanics now and such an explanation of the phenomenon uh, was given by max planck in year 1900 about which we will talk maybe in the third episode now uh, le let's move on to the second experiment i mentioned earlier which i want to take up for today uh, that is the photoelectric effect another very very important experiment uh, which posed a serious challenge to classical mechanics the experiment is as follows i suppose i take certain metal a soft metal like cesium or so and if i throw some light on that what we observe is that when light falls on that it emits electrons from this metal and uh, if it go on throwing light electrons keep coming out of there and the electrons which are coming out constitute current so such an effect where is you are getting electrical current as a consequence of light is called as photoelectric effect and the electrons which are emitted because of light are called as photo electrons okay so that is a kind of phenomenon i'm talking about now what's important is that when this experiment was studied somewhere around 1887 uh, what we found was that there are a few important observations the first observation significant one was that is uh, the moment you throw light you find a current coming over there the moment switch off the light there's no current that means this emission of electrons from the metal is instantaneous there is no time lag between the light falling on the metal and electrons coming from there that's the first and significant observation second observation was that if i throw light of a certain wavelength say a certain uh, low frequency uh, uh, this thing we find that there's no electron coming out i increase the frequency slightly we find that still there's no current coming increase the frequency further we find okay now now the current starts coming that means electrons need certain that means the metal needs certain uh, minimum amount of frequency of the radiation for electrons to be emitted from there if i go on increasing frequency we find that electrons keep coming uh, that means the current keeps flowing but uh, the electrons which come off they are of higher kinetic energy we did uh, there's something called as stopping potential which uh, physicists typically talk about that means that is how the experiment was designed that means we try to increase potential so that we don't let the electrons come off that is called a stopping potential and stopping potential actually is a measure of the kinetic energy of electrons coming off but for us it's suffice to know that we need a minimum amount of frequency uh, for the radiation to electrons for the electrons to be coming out from the metal that is called as a threshold frequency that is the second observation the third one was as i just mentioned uh that if i keep on increasing frequency okay let's say this uh, this is the kinetic energy of electrons we am trying to increase frequency over there so what you see is as the frequency is very low we can see that there is no current there's no uh, current coming over there as you go on increasing frequency you come to certain value new not at this stage electrons start coming off as we increase the frequency further we find that electrons keep coming and they have 
more and more kinetic energy as we proceed further. So, we find that the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectrons increase with the frequency that is the third observation we have. And then the fourth observation was that if I have the same metal and I, I increase the intensity of radiation which is falling on there, what is observed thereafter is that the current continues to be there, but the current, uh, the intensity of the current or the magnitude of current increases. That means, uh, the, with increase in intensity, there is more current coming there. At the same time, the stopping potential of these uh, electrons remain the same. That means, all these electrons which come off, they come out with the same kinetic energy. That is the fourth observation we have. So, let us see uh, what are the four things we have seen there. The photo emission is instantaneous, that is there is no time lag. A minimum frequency is, that is called as a threshold frequency is required. Thirdly, the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectrons increase with frequency. And lastly, increasing intensity increases the number of electrons, but their kinetic energy does not change. So, there are four significant observations vis-a-vis -vis our uh, experiment of photoelectric effect. Let us see what classical mechanics tells us on this. The classical predictions, uh, let us take one of uh, one by one all of these. The first is that classically speaking, our radiation is existing as a wave okay? and the energy of this radiation is distributed over the whole wave. So, we have a small electron target over there. So, what classical mechanics says is we have a small target uh, say electron over here, this is wave coming there. Okay? Now, what it says is this wave is coming with certain amount of energy, this electron needs certain energy to come off from there. So, as this wave is coming, this keeps on absorbing energy. When sufficient amount of energy comes to this, it will come off. That means, the electron should not be knocked off immediately. It should come out after certain amount of time. There should be a time lag according to classical mechanics. That is uh, the first observation or first prediction of classical mechanics is that there must be a time lag between throwing the light on the metal and electrons coming from there. But we remember that experimentally we observed just the opposite of that. Second prediction. Now, second prediction is that since we have the electron and my radiation is coming, uh, the classical mechanics uh, presumes or uh, suggests that, that no matter what, energy, what wavelength I take, what frequency I take, uh, as long as suppose I take uh, say a low frequency uh, uh, radiation. So, low frequency means it is a high wavelength radiation coming there, energy is low, it is coming there, it gets absorbed to certain extent, maybe I have to pass this radiation for a long time and when the enough energy is there, it will come off. If I take higher energy one, it will come out faster, that is all. The only thing is, uh, there is no need for any threshold frequency. That means, the electron should come out irrespective of what is the wavelength or what is the frequency of radiations used for the purpose. That is the second prediction from our classical mechanics, again uh, in uh, contradiction with the experimental observation. Thirdly, if I increase the amplitude, uh, that means if I increase the intensity, basically I am increasing the amplitude. What it means is, a higher intensity radiation means what? Higher intensity radiation means that intensity, uh, this radiation has got a higher amplitude. Uh, Let us take an example. Now, suppose you are standing uh, near the seashore, a small wave comes, a ripple comes. It just comes, hits you and that is all, matter ends thereafter, nothing happens to you. But as against that, suppose a large wave comes, a large wave comes with large mag uh, amplitude or there is lot of energy in that, that can even knock you off the feet. Okay? So, you will be thrown off from the seashore. So, that is what exactly uh, is expected from our, uh, this phenomenon over here. If I increase intensity, what is expected is that if a high intensity radiation is coming, the electron will be knocked off and it will have high kinetic energy. Whereas, what we experimentally observed was that the kinetic energy of electrons when it came off uh, on increasing the intensity had no change. It came out with the same kinetic energy because and, and the kinetic energy depended only on the uh, frequency of radiation and not on the intensity. So, let us again see what we experimentally observed and what is classical prediction over there. Cla experimentally observed there is no time lag, classical prediction is there must be a time lag. Second of experimental observation was that we need a minimum frequency called as threshold frequency. Classical prediction does not look forward to any threshold frequency. Thirdly, the kinetic energy of the emitted photon increases with frequency. 
whereas classical prediction is that class kinetic energy should depend on intensity and not on frequency. And fourthly, increasing intensity increases number of electrons, but kinetic energy remains the same, whereas classical prediction is the increase in intensity should give faster electrons and not more electrons. We find that all the four counts, experimental observations and the classical predictions do not match. That is the second instance we are saying uh, and what we find from here is that the predictions from classical mechanics are not in agreement with the experiment. That is or in other words we can say the classical mechanics is inadequate to explain the results of photoelectric effect. And uh, a successful explanation of photoelectric effect was given by Albert Einstein in 1905. Let us sum up what we have done today. What we have done today is uh, we started with understanding what is the basic premise of classical mechanics uh, and on the basis of that how comfortable we are in explaining the macroscopic observations what we have with us. And thereafter having established that classical mechanics works fairly well for macroscopic system, uh, we came down to uh, two experiments particularly, one blackboard radiation and two a photoelectric effect and on the basis of these two experiments uh, we have been able to see uh, that the experimental observations what we had and the theoretical predictions from classical mechanics do not match. That means uh, the classical mechanics happens to be inadequate in explaining the results of these experiments. In my next episode I will take up three more cases, one is that of anomalous heat capacity of solids second uh, is atomic line spectrum and thirdly Compton effect to re-emphasize uh, this uh, assertion of mine that classical mechanics is inadequate in explaining certain experimental phenomenon. And once having done that uh, in the later episodes maybe the third episode we will try to find out a, a solution to this that means uh, we, we will bring in the concept of quantization and see how does this uh, get over. Uh, this inadequacy of classical mechanics and does explain all these results fairly well. <laughs>